Hello and welcome back to the series Masters of the Chessboard. In this series we are going through the famous book by Richard Retty, uh, Masters of the Chessboard, and looking at each of the games in that book one at a time and Retty's analysis of those games. This is game number 45 and we are continuing to look at the games of Aaron Nimzowicz, the famous author of My System. His opponent is Paul Jonner. Now, before we get started, um, Retty offers a bit of a introduction to uh, the this game or or the opening. Uh, so we're going to start looking at in this game an Indian defense. Now, Retty comments that Retty sort of argues a bit against. Uh, after e4 playing e5 or after d4 playing d5 because after let's say d4 d5 this pawn becomes a bit of a, uh, a but this pawn becomes very fixed and is a point of attack and very often you would see c4 threatening to take this pawn and white is able to try and threaten to open up the position by playing c4 to try and get an open game because white moves first so white's often got the initiative whereas black is often less able to try and push c5 quite as, uh, as early or try to push e5 quite as early um because black is the one who is usually defending So because of that, the Shigorin defense, well, the, the, there was like an India game based on the Shigorin, but it started, started with knight f6. So knight f6 is played to control this e4 square. You don't want white getting e4 in. And then after c4, d6, knight c3, knight b to d7, and now white can no longer prevent black from playing e5. So after e4, e5 would occur. And this is quite similar to the Philidor defense. Now, if white exchanges pawns, then the game is fairly balanced. However, if black is forced to exchange pawns, then white will have a central advantage with the pawn on e4 and c4 to black's pawn on d6. Now white has a few extra options though. White can exchange pawns and get into a fairly balanced game. Um, white's d4 pawn can potentially be a bit better protected than black's e5 pawn because this pawn is protected by the queen naturally. And and also this bishop can come out and protect its, uh, this pawn, whereas this bishop you're going to have a hard time to perhaps protecting it unless you're free and chatter it to uh, g7. Now this means that in this position this e5 pawn is potentially going to be a bit of a weakness for black. It, you would struggle quite a bit to take this uh, pawn, but it's certainly uh, it's a fixed point of attack for white. And white also has the option of pushing d5 and gaining space. So this means that the center is still really quite fluid. It's not defined. It can go a number of different, different ways, all of which white can choose which way to go for, and all of which um, white will sort of have the initiative and the play for. And something also worth noting is this bishop is stuck behind his pawns which we saw in the previous game by Nimsowich, um almost a Philidor defense and how a Philidor perhaps wasn't quite as strong as some of the other similar pawn structure situations because the bishop was a bad bishop being stuck behind these pawns. Now this defense was originally created by Shigorin However, it's not really played that much because white has so many options to essentially get an advantage. So, there we are. However, um, I'm just looking at my notes. However, 
Nimzowicz started uh, looking at the Indian defense. So the Indian defense starts off very similar with knight f6, except it looks at trying to control the center. So there's three sort of names for Indian defenses. If you fianchetto the bishop on the king's side, it's the king's Indian. If you fianchetto it on the queen's side, it's the queen's Indian. Or if you don't fianchetto it at all, it is the old Indian. Now, Reti argues quite strongly against the king's Indian defense, because if you imagine after d4, if, let's say we go for the, uh, just a few starting moves for the king's Indian, Reti argues that the bishop on g7 is basically trying to attack this d4 pawn. And he argues that black has no business trying to attack this d4 pawn because it's already defended by the queen. Um, it's not a counter attack. Black is simply trying to launch a counter. Uh, black is simply trying to just attack the pawn, and because black isn't moving first, black it should be really it, black should be more defending than trying to attack. So Reti is quite critical of the king's Indian defense. However, the Queen's Indian defense, uh, this is the accelerated version, but the Queen's Indian defense, after Bishop b7, he is quite praiseworthy of. Because he says that one of White's main aims would be to perhaps try and push e4. And we've got Knight f6 stopping e4, Bishop b7 would also be stopping e4. And also, we can potentially try and stop any d5 pawn advances. Um, because the knight would be controlling d5 and the bishop would also be controlling d5. So this bishop being fianchettoed on b7 continues very much in the same line as black's first move after knight f6. Now Reti comments that the main difference between Indian defences and defences where you just play d5 on the very first move is the, the freedom of black's pawn position. If white is determined to play e4, then black doesn't necessarily need to continue with their plan and stop white from playing e, e4. Um, black may instead continue playing d6 and e5 themselves. And very often this bishop might be fianchetto to g7, or it might be pushed out of the pawn chain. And we'll see something very similar um, in the game with Nimzowicz, where this bishop ends up outside of the pawn chain. And this is what makes this, these Indian defences quite a bit different to the one which Shigorin made, where this bishop was inside the pawn chain. Now in the game... We obviously saw d4, seeing as we're talking about um, Indian defences. And knight f6, preventing e4 and preventing d5 at the same time. c4, e6. And then we have knight c3. So this is... Well, next we had bishop b4. So this is now the Nimzo Indian defence. Um, Reti does comment that knight f3 is often played to avoid this pin. However, there are plenty of options you can go play against when it comes to knight f3 as well. You, you just need a, almost two systems, one for knight c3 and one for knight f3. And then one for any other move which white may consider. Now here, white played e3. This is coined, this is to, uh, called the normal line of the Nimzo Indian. And white shuts in the dark square bishop. And essentially white is trying to not uh, force an advantage out of the opening. And, because, and, and so white plays quite simply. White is happy with equality. White is not going to try and force an advantage. They're just going to play simple, simple moves. And therefore, black can play quite simple moves as well. They don't have to try and develop their bishop to b7 to counter white's e4 plans, because white's already put a pawn on e3. 
So e4 isn't necessarily a big risk. So because of that, black can just castle here. We then see bishop to d3, and now c5. And this has all been seen today in the uh, Nimzu Indian. It's a very typical way, Reggie comments that it's a typical way of preventing white from getting a strong pawn center. Uh, you don't really want white to try and play e4. Of course, if white did play e4, then they would hang the d4 pawn. So, and, and this c5 move we've seen in quite a few different um, positions. It, when white plays d4, a very common pawn break for black is c5. It's a very, it's a very thematic move in these uh, d4 positions, and in this instance, it stops e4. Now white responded to that with knight f3, with knight c6, castles, bishop takes c3, and now b takes c3. So black has given up the bishop pair. However, in return, white has got these double pawns, and this pawn on c5 is stopping these pawns from ever really... Uh, moving, these two pawns are now blockaded because of this pawn on c5, and white wouldn't particularly want to give up the center by playing d take c5. So these two pawns would become targets of an attack later on, and also white's bishop on c1 is currently blocked in by their own pawn, so after something like b6, this bishop will have very limited scope. Uh, and so, yes, white has the bishop pair, but currently white's only really got one good bishop. So that's, um, that's the idea that black is hoping to try and uh, blockade and win these pawns, and it's arguing that perhaps this bishop pair isn't actually that useful in this position. Whereas white will be arguing the opposite, and trying to prove the opposite. Now here, Nimzowicz played d6. We have knight to d2. So this protects c4, and it's potentially going to b3. So if black ever plays knight a5 to attack this pawn, the knight, this knight can jump to b3 to challenge this knight on a5. And it also allows f4. Uh, this f4 retic says is very important because um, black probably wants to push e5 to try and develop this bishop. And after f4, e5, f takes e5, um, white will then have the open f file and will still have a decent amount of center control. Here we see b6. And now knight to b3. And Reti is saying that this is a mistake. He said that f4 should have been played immediately to try and get an open game for white and to, uh, to essentially try and off gain, gain this open f file for white. And of course, white has the bishop pair, so having the open game is going to be a lot more beneficial. Uh, Nimzowicz plays e5 as uh, as planned, opening lines for this bishop. And here we see f. Sorry, here we see f4. However, Reggie says that this f4 move being played now doesn't allow the f file to be opened. However, he says that a move like d5 would be potentially even worse because something like e4 could, could come next, potentially followed by knight to e5, and black's going to have a very strong position here. They're, they're attacking this weak pawn. The knights are a nice little outpost here. They, they've got a very strong position there. So d5 would have been even worse. However, we saw f4, and now we see e4 pushing the bishop away to defended by the knight. Bishop to e2. And now queen d7 with an exclamation mark. And 
this move is primarily aimed at trying to stop any potential kingside pawn pushes. So essentially trying to restrict white on the king side. And black's eventual aim is to play something like h5, queen f5, and then queen h7. It's just gaining control and space on the king side and stopping any potential white counterplay on the king side. We see h3 played, knight to e7, and now queen e1. And Betty comments that in this position, white's biggest weakness is this bishop. This bishop is undeveloped, it's on its original square, and hasn't really got any good prospects, immediate prospects. So he said that bishop d2, bishop e1, followed by bishop h4, is white's best bet to try and free up their position. But we don't see that. We see queen to e1, h5. So he played h5 as soon as the queen moved off because obviously before there was a double attack on this pawn. We then see bishop to d2, queen f5, king h2, and now queen h7. So Nimzowicz is completed the manoeuvre that was started with queen d7 and now he hopes to try and push his own kingside pawns to try and create a kingside attack uh, and with this whole with this manoeuvre with the bishop on c8 the queen on h7 the uh, the knight on f6 he's quite successfully stopped any hope of white being able to push their own pawns and get their own um, kingside attack uh, going here, white plays a4. Nimzowicz responds with knight f5. So, currently threatening knight to g4 check. If we just pass the move, knight g4 check, h takes g4, h takes g4 check with the queen. Then king g1 is forced because the knight's obviously defending this square. And then g3 will come. And mate is threatened because the king can't run away. And so the only way that white could defend against mate is by taking the, queen, the pawn on g6, which would just lose the queen. So that's the threat with uh, this knight f5 move. The threat is knight to g4 check. So to prevent knight g4, White plays g3, and now we see Nimzowicz play a5, blocking White's queen side, stopping any uh, potential counterplay on the queen side. And we see something similar to last game, how Nimzowicz sort of got a bit of... He did what he wanted in the centre, so here he's got his pawn on e4, it's a strong pawn, it's limiting White's uh, position. He's got equal control in the centre. He's restricted white on the king side, and he's restricted white on the queen side, and he's starting to gradually improve his, the position of his pieces so he can control both sides of the board as best and effectively as possible. Now here we see rook to g1, knight to h6, bishop f1, bishop d7, bishop to c1, and now rook a to c8. To c8. Uh, black is hoping to try and force white to, to try and push d5. Uh, because after d5, the center will be locked and um, white's queen side, queen side will be completely immobilized. And so at that point, Nimzowicz will be able to very easily focus on the king side, which is where he wants to focus. So that's where all his pieces are. That's where his bishop's aimed. That's where he wants to play. White obliges and plays d5. Um, Reti comments that white doesn't necessarily have to play d5 here, but eventually uh, black would still play bishop e6 and try and get some counterplay against this weak c4 pawn. So he plays d5 to stop bishop e6 and to 
essentially limit the op options of open to try and attack this weak board. We see king h8, knight to d2, rook g8, bishop to g2, or g5. So Nimzovich is starting the uh, his own attack on the king side. See knight f1, rook to g7, rook a2, knight f5, a whole bunch of maneuvering, bishop h1, rook c to g8, queen to d1, and now g takes f4. And Reti comments that, oh, uh, let's, let's pause for a moment. We see how White has gradually tried to bring all of his pieces over. He played knight f1 to try and guard this g3 pawn. He's moved his bishop back so he can try and come here. His queen is able to hopefully keep an eye on this pawn, uh, able to go into the second rank quite easily. Uh, the, the queen's very able to defend. However, all of these pieces are on the back rank except for this one rook. White's super passive here. White is not geared up to do anything except just just defend. And you know, like uh, uh, the position is already essentially lost. Um, well, it is lost. The computer actually evaluates this as uh, minus eight point five. The top computer move is G takes F four. The next computer move is Knight H six. The next one after that is knight to g4 check, and all of those are minus 7, minus 7.8, 8, minus 8.5. The position is lost for black already. And Nimzowicz plays the top engine move, g takes f4. Now, Vetti commented that opening up the game like this needed a, a, a lot of consideration, since now black's, um, now black's e4 pawn will be potentially threatened in the future. So doing this, opening the game up in this way requires quite a lot of consideration because after e takes f4, white can try and play rook e2, they can try and uh, attack this pawn with the remainder of their pieces which previously didn't have access to it because of this e3 pawn blocking the way. So Reti was coming at this does need quite a bit of consideration and calculation but it was all completely sound, and it was the best engine move. Here, Nimzowicz plays bishop c8, and he's hoping to play bishop a6 to try and attack this c4 pawn, essentially trying to divert white's pieces away from the king side. So we see queen to b3, bishop a6, and now rook e2. So white's trying to get some counterplay against this weak e4 pawn. Um, Reti comments that if after something like bishop uh, d2 intending bishop e1 to try and protect the g3 pawn, Nimzowicz had planned rook g6, bishop e1, protecting the pawn, and now knight to g4 check. And the idea is after h takes g4, h takes g4, with a check, the king would have to go to g2. And now after something like bishop takes c4, queen takes c4, e3 is the key move here. It's cutting off this retreat square, so the king can't go to here or here. So mating 1 is threatened. And the only way to prevent it is to take on e3, which would therefore lose the queen. It's a beautiful little tactic. I, I think there was a lot more tactics open to uh, black, but this is the one that Reti chose because it's a, a very nice tactic with this little e th e3 pawn push. It's a quiet move that threatens everything. So we didn't see bishop d1, bishop e2. Instead, we saw rook e2, trying to get some counterplay. We then see knight h4, and this knight, it, it can't be taken. Um, after g takes h4, I guess a, you just immediately lose the exchange, and now this knight is hanging. Um, you, you can't defend it 
because after queen g7 you're threatening quite a lot of diff you're threatening mate and there's no way uh, to, to stop mate uh, the top computer move is f5 because there's no way to stop mate in two and you've got a few different ways but rook g2 is probably the simpl simplest because after bishop takes queen g2 is mate Also after here, rook takes g1, if you try and defend the knight some other way, like uh, queen to d1 here, again you'd have queen g6, threatening all, all of the different mates, and now bishop e3 is a top line, but then rook takes f1 is played, and and now you, you can't take back, queen takes f1 because queen g3 is mate. And there's just a whole bunch of different mating ideas uh, open to black, and it's not really that it's not that surprising at all, because just the, the queen is currently out of play, and you're about to get your queen into play, and suddenly you've got all three heavy pieces on this open G file, and nothing to really challenge them. So it's not too surprising really that there was all of these tactics resulting from the position. So taking is just going to be losing. So instead we see knight, uh, rook e3 trying to add another defender to this um, g3 pawn. Um, Reti does comment that if white had tried to play knight to d2 trying to capture this weak pawn because now it's attacked twice it's attacked three times and it's defended twice then something like bishop to c8 would follow and then if white continues with knight takes e4 then bishop, uh, queen f5 would come creating this battery and therefore threatening mate in one knight f2 is given by Reti defending this square however Queen takes h h three comes anyway, because after knight takes we have a nice little knight to g four mate, so mate with the two knights. So instead we see rook to e three guarding this uh, g three point. Bishop to c eight, similar to before eyeing up this weak pawn. Queen to c two. And now bishop takes h3. Now white can't take this bishop because queen f5 check and white's position will just fall apart. Um, if you try and retreat the, the king to something like king h2, then it's mate in three. Um, knight to g4 check, king h3, and knight f2 check, and now. Uh, if king takes h4, then this is mate. If the, the king goes back, then this is still mate. Uh, now, that, that was just one of the potential options, but after the king takes, so after the king takes here, uh, everything is, well, after queen, eight, queen f5 check, everything is now losing for white. It, it, it's mate in seven with best play according to the computer. So white didn't take. Instead, they took the pawn on e4. However, we now see bishop to f5, attacking the pawn, and sorry, attacking the bishop, but also uh, attacking x-ray and the queen. So bishop takes f5 is basically forced. We see knight takes f5, attacking the rook. Rook to e2, now h4, continuing the attack. Rook g to g2, sorry. Rook g to g2. H takes g3, discovered attack. King to g1. Now queen h3 was played. Knight e3, so obviously... So uh, white played knight to e3, 
And now knight to h4, attacking here, threatening, threatening to come here. You see king f1, trying to uh, run away if they can. And now rook e8, and here white resigned. And there's a few different options. If we look at some of the potential moves, um, let's say white played queen d1. We'd have something like rook, rook g to g8. And it's, these are now the computer moves. So rook a2, knight to g4, knight takes g4, and now knight takes g2. Rook takes g2, rook takes g4, bishop to b2, and it's now mate in three. Uh, queen h1 will be coming. So that's most of the threats in this position after rook e8. The, the main threat is um, queen to h1. So all of, uh, in this position, the main threat is queen to h1. So all of the options are mainly about trying to prevent the different mate threats and in this position there's just nothing that uh, white can do to try and prevent it. If they tried something like f5, which I think was a potential engine line and with some engines, we then uh, the engine response was then knight to f3. So now this is a mate threat because rook g1 doesn't guard against it. Bishop to b2, queen h1, and that's mate. So the only way to really defend is something like rook e1, essentially trying to give yourself a bit of a runaway square. But even then, this is mating 11, a queen h1 check. Uh, and then if if queen g1, this will be mating 3. Queen f2 is mate. Oh, no, sorry, not yet. Uh, this is now mate. So, uh, whereas if the king runs away, then I guess initially you're just up a rook and you're forking, but it's also uh, mate in nine. And of course, this knight is also pinned, and as soon as the king moves, you could potentially try and take this knight. Uh, I'm assuming this bishop will probably have moved by then. But that's the that's the position. That's why in this position, White resigned because almost everything White does is losing. Uh, well, everything White does does is losing. White's just simply lost here. Black uh, has far too many threats. Uh, the king has too few escape squares. This rook is pinned, and this rook is ready to come in. This rook can come come down and also come in if it needs to. And the, the knights are able to come in quite easily as well. And meanwhile, white has nothing. White's entire position is just so restricted, which is usually the other way around. Usually it's black's position, which is a little bit more restricted. But yeah, so that's game number 45. Another game of Nimzowicz. And looking at the Indian defences against d4. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please do like, comment, and subscribe. We've got another um, Nimzowicz game next, looking at the Nimzowicz defense. So yeah, I hope to see you next time then for that video. Thank you for watching.